Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So the Straw Hat Riot of 1922 is a very strange piece of history. Uh, For one, there's no clear reason for it. Uh, We don't really know how it started. And even the way it was perceived at the time seems to have been a mix of mild irritation, a little bit of boys will be boys permissiveness, and then some outright frustration and anger. Uh, And while there are news articles from the time about how things played out, there are still some pretty big gaps. And we'll talk about those. But uh, it all centered around the boater hat. So I thought it might be fun to kind of look at this topic from a really wide angle, starting with just how straw hats came into Western culture and developed, and then how the boater became so important to men's fashion in the early 20th century, all leading to this very strange conflict that, while it's often called a riot, singular, actually played out over the course of several nights in New York. We don't really know when straw was first used as a material to make hats in Western culture. The lack of historical knowledge on this subject is probably because for a long time, at least in Europe, using those kinds of materials was really something confined to the lower classes. But there are mentions of plant-based materials used for hat making as far back as ancient Rome, including depictions of the goddess Hera in a tall hat made of braided grasses and in early Greek and Roman writing. But there really isn't much in the way of detail in any of these writings or visual depictions. They're just kind of named and then they move on. Uh, We can pick up the thread in European history as far back as 1459, and an English knight, Sir John Fastoff, died. In one written description of his final moments, straw hats are specifically mentioned. From that point on, straw headwear became more and more commonly mentioned in literature, including in the works of William Shakespeare, Edmund Spencer, and Samuel Pepys. These hats became increasingly common in paintings as well. Yeah, that that note just says that he is possessed of straw and hats. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he was wearing them or just had them nearby. Maybe he had so many hats that it was particularly worthy of note. <laughs> he was that hat guy. <laughs> uh, I feel like when I go, people will be like, she had a lot of high tops. Um, some sources claim that Mary, Queen of Scots, brought straw hats to Scotland in the 1550s. And from there, that fashion traveled throughout the British Isles. But uh, I was looking at a book called Straw Hats, Their History and Manufacture, which was published in 1922. And in it, author Henry Inwards makes the case that while woven straw hats were already known in the region at the time, plated or braided styles of straw hats may have, in fact, traveled from France with Mary when she journeyed to Scotland. If you grew up where I did, you may also say that plaited. Yes, I have heard it both ways. Uh, And just to be clear, it's like, they kind of uh, braid the fibers into, you know, a braid, and then that those braids are sewn together to create the hat. Straw hats for women were rated as a necessity by 1694, and that was in the book The Ladies' Dictionary Being a General Entertainment for the Fair Sex, a work never attempted before in English. After that, straw hats for women weren't just commonly mentioned in Western literature and depicted in paintings. They were seen virtually everywhere. Those styles and millinery techniques used to make them really varied widely by location. Even the materials used were completely different from one region to another, depending on what local grass or straw was most abundant. Originally, most of these hats used the fiber pretty much exactly as it grew from the earth. But plated or plaited straw hats created this way could quickly become heavy and burdensome. And so to lighten the load, enterprising hat makers eventually started pulling the outer sheath of the straw away, leaving the lighter and more pliable interior to work with. Another approach to improving on the raw materials involved splitting straws down the middle lengthwise with a knife. At some point, braids were also created that used these two halves of the straw placed together again after cutting, and that retained the same amount of material but made it a lot easier to plait the straw and create finer work. 
As these experiments with straw for hats continued, two branches of the technique developed split straw or whole straw. And in addition to giving milliners options regarding the pliability and the weight of the hats, the decorative uses for straw on the hats opened up. Yeah, you'll also see uh, developing along these times uh, what's called straw work embroidery that was sometimes used on gowns uh, as a fun fact for people that like film costumes. Uh, the wedding dresses in the Ang Lee Sense and Sensibility have straw work embroidery on them. Um, if you ever get to see those in real life, they're quite pretty. I love that movie. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, so straw was being used on hats and that kind of embroidery and this idea that it could be more than just a functional thing, but also something that could be turned into some really delicate shapes and and some really beautiful um, decorative work was also happening. And soon, a wider range of fibers started to become available for what were still generally called straw hats, even though many different things were used. And that was thanks to global trade. So eventually, raffia, bamboo, hemp, and even silk that was made into stiff ribbons uh, were all used in what were called straw hats, particularly in England, uh, where this really became a huge industry. And it took advantage of all of those techniques that had been developed over centuries just using local grasses. And then they were basically applying these new materials to those techniques. And Great Britain had emerged as the nexus of straw hat manufacture by the 18th century. But then in the mid-19th century, other countries that had developed their own straw hat industries began exporting to Great Britain. Bonnets were the most popular straw hat style of the late 1850s and early 1860s, and the ones made in Switzerland, France, and Italy in particular were often very ornate and embellished beautifully, and that really put a dent in Britain's hat industry. Then imports from China and Japan started to arrive. Asian countries had been using grasses and straw and braided goods long before this idea caught on in Europe. So their work was really excellent, even when they were building on designs that had originated in Europe. Even the raw materials imported from other countries displaced locally grown grasses as the material of choice in British hat makers. This was a very real threat to the livelihoods of many tradespeople in Britain at the time. While milliners worked with all kinds of materials to create hats, platters, who specifically worked with straw and grass to create hats, were being displaced. And so, as a a form of solution, in 1896, the British Straw Platting Company was created to try to find a solution to this problem and reduce the likelihood that an entire workforce would find itself without income. This company basically leveraged the fact that it was a cooperative effort of many hat makers who would all promote straw hats and place orders with local craftspeople to give straw hat making in their home country a shot in the arm. That worked, at least briefly, as new designs emerged and the platters made an effort to really compete with the work that was coming into Britain from other countries. But importers also wanted to compete and they started slashing their prices. By the end of 1899, the British Straw Platting Company was out of business. It was just too expensive to produce hats in Britain compared to making them in other places. Additionally, this craft of making hats had changed. So starting in the mid-1860s, various techniques were developed to sew uh, braided straw into shapes by machine rather than by hand. And over the course of just a few years, machine-stitched straw hats were the standard, and hand-stitching was only done on very coarse materials that just weren't suitable to run through a machine. And soon, sewing machine manufacturers were all offering their own machines that could stitch plaits together to create hats. Over the years, many, many different styles of hat were developed, both for women and for men. And one of these hats for men, the boater, is the focus of the rest of this episode. We will get right into that after we pause for a word from one of the sponsors that keeps Stuff You Missed in History class going. So the boater hat, just in case you are not familiar with it, is a flat-topped hat with straight sides and a very flat brim. And it's usually made with plaited straw stitched together in a spiral and then blocked onto a form. And around the base of the crown is a ribbon, which uh, in modern era, you usually see a striped ribbon. For a long time in its earlier inception, the ribbon was usually black. And while boaters are still seen today, the origin of this hat style is reportedly different depending on source. 
Everything from 1822 to the 1880s is mentioned as the advent of the boater. In all likelihood, this is probably because there were boater-like hats on the early end of that time scale, and they started to look more like what we would call a boater as time went on. So I think that is probably why there is some discrepancy there. In the United States, the boater became more and more popular starting in the late 1800s, first with younger hat wearers and then with middle-class men. And by the 1920s, boaters were practically required as summer menswear. They offered shade and were cooler temperature-wise than felt hats were. Yeah, every well-dressed gentleman always had his boater in the summer. And a cultural rule began for men of wearing a boater from May 15th to September 15th. This, uh, a lot like the idea of not wearing white after Labor Day, just kind of became accepted and adhered to by the majority of New Yorkers in particular. It was throughout the country, but New York was very serious about this whole thing. A September 13th, 1925 article in the New York Times with the byline of the initials EAJ skewered the entire social convention of these hat calendar rules. It read, Is it not written in the great book of the herd? On May 15th shall men don the straw, it being authorized by long and accredited tradition. And on September 15th shall man doff the same or be judged a mocker of the herd gods? This article goes on to cite the statistic that 80 to 90 percent of all hat sales take place during just two separate weeks of the year, one in May and one in September. Yeah, there is a a subtle side eye in that article that is cast toward the hat trade as maybe being the people that are stirring this whole thing up. There is some uh, very subtle, but really their racism to it because most... uh, hat sellers and haberdashers were Jewish at the time in New York. Um, But yeah, there is this suggestion of like, you have just stirred this whole thing up so you can make a ton of money two weeks of the year. Uh, But this tradition or social law had this element not unlike the deeply irritating practice that still sometimes takes place here in the U.S. of pinching people on St. Patrick's Day if they aren't wearing green. There is a lot to unpack there. But in short, that whole thing is so wrong. (laughs) Please don't ever do that. If you do it, I can't promise that I won't enact some sort of cruelty to you uh, if I witness it. But in New York, uh, the way this played out is that if a man was wearing a straw hat after September 15th, it was common and really kind of accepted for a kid to whip it off his head and stomp it in the street. Again, don't do stuff like that. Uh, This was generally an issue of irritating shenanigans, but it was not seen as especially dangerous. But then in 1922, things did get out of hand. Before things boiled over in September of that year, there had been an article in the New York Times on May 7th titled Straw Hats for 1922. It outlined just how serious a man had to be about his boater. This article opened with, quote, the choice of your straw hat this year will require more serious thought and consideration than formerly. And that article discussed the wide range of boaters that had become available, and that no properly dressed gentleman could get by with just one hat for the season. The China split straw style was preferred for evening attire, and the Panama style for semi-dress. If you were going out for a round of golf, the leghorn straw hat was the proper choice. Even the shade of the straw, the article advised, had to be carefully considered. The writer advised that the public needed education about how to properly care for a straw hat and also extolled the virtues of American hats. French hats were deemed too fanciful. English hats were too heavy and prone to discoloration. But there is a particular paragraph in that article which kind of jumps out in retrospect. It opens with, Less attention will be paid this year to the conventional dates for putting on and taking off straw hats. And then it concludes with, this season, the temperature will be the chief arbiter of fashions. This could not have been more wrong. The trouble started on September 13th, 1922, two days before the random and completely arbitrary date of September 15th that had been set down as the socially accepted end of straw hat wearing season. The New York Times reported, quote, on the theory that September 15th is the last day of straw hat season and that they had the right to declare open season on straw hats on other person's heads, scores of rowdies on the east side and in other parts of the city started smashing hats last evening. 
They were snatching the hats from the heads of the wearers and then smashing them in the street or throwing them onto bonfires. Yeah, there are some uh, accounts that this actually kind of got a little bit of fuel from the fact that, like, kids who were normally doing this sort of thing because they thought it was fun, again, you can hear the disdain in my voice, I'm sure, (laughs) Um, had actually gone after a group of dock workers and the dock workers fought back and that kind of fueled this whole, like, tension and, and anger about it. And that's kind of what sparked this to get bigger than it was. I read that in a few places. I didn't find hard confirmation of it. So just FYI, if you see that, that's the scoop. Uh, but from the night of the 13th, seven men were apprehended and they were brought before Magistrate Peter A. Hatting. That name is just a really nice coincidence. And he found them all guilty, and he fined each of them $5. But he was serious that he did not like any of this business. He was adamant that he was not going to be so lenient going forward of people brought into his night court for hat snatching and stomping. He gave this statement in the courtroom, and it was printed in the Times on September 14th. Quote, It is against the law to smash a man's hat, and he has the right to wear it in a January snowstorm if he wishes. To hit a man's hat is simple assault, and in this court it will be treated as such. And I want you to spread this word among all who would smash hats. A man's hat is just as much his property and is just as much to be defended as his watch, and the courts are going to enforce the laws. But Magistrate Hatting's warning did not really have the desired effect because there were more attacks the night of the 14th. And one headline the next day read, Boys Scalp Straw Hatted. And it mentioned that the reason for the riot was, quote, yet undiscovered. No one knew why this was going on. On the 15th, the New York Times ran an editorial that supported Hatting's position. The editorial also mentioned that it wasn't clear where this entire social law had even come from and that, quote, its enforcement is left to boys and others with undeveloped minds who delight in destruction for its own sake, especially when it is accompanied by noise and excitement and when it makes somebody else angry. This reminds me of so many sports riots. Mm -hmm. The writer also went on to note that a man should, quote, fight if he can and call the police if he can't. And then on the night of the 15th, the rioting intensified. The New York Times, September 16, 1922, coverage of the previous night opened with this line. Gangs of young hoodlums ran riot in various parts of the city last night, smashing unseasonable straw hats and trampling them in the street. The article describes mobs, some including hundreds of boys and young men, prowling city blocks looking for straw hat wearers to punish. Anytime the police were called and showed up on a scene to break up these mobs, they would disperse, only to reform elsewhere shortly thereafter. The New York Tribune reported, quote, boys who were guided by the calendar rather than the weather, and most of all by their own troublemaking proclivities, indulged in a straw hat smashing orgy throughout the city last night. A dozen or more were arrested, and seven were spanked ignominiously by their parents in the East 104th Street Police Station by order of the lieutenant of the desk. There's a lot to unpack there, too. There is. There's a lot to unpack in terms of social norms throughout this episode. Uh, So sticks with nails uh, run through the tips were the weapons of choice for some of these boys and young men who were forcing men that they encountered on the street to basically run a gauntlet of them in the hopes that their nails would snag the hats. Uh, Obviously, this is also incredibly dangerous because it's a sharp object that you're waving at somebody's head. There were also sneak attacks where unsuspecting pedestrians were jumped by one or two boys at a time. On the streetcar tracks on Christopher Street, lines of boys and young men waited by the tracks and snatched hats from the passengers as they passed by. According to the statement of a man named E.C. Jones, his Amsterdam Avenue streetcar was boarded by a group of boys at 9 p.m. on September 15th. These boys attacked passengers and then rejoined a mob that Jones uh, estimated to be as large as a 1,000 people, a number that seems pretty unlikely, but at this point is impossible to fact check. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how things played out on the night of September 15th. But first, we're going to take a quick break for a word from one of our sponsors. So 
on the night of September 15th, in the midst of all of this hat smashing, uh, one particularly bad spot was the area ranging from 102nd to 125th Streets in Manhattan, along 3rd, Lexington, and Park Avenues in particular. Eight boys from a group of 10 to 12 were apprehended by two policemen. Those policemen were named Lemur and King, and they had spotted the kids running from a doorway with sticks in their hand. And though the captured boys were taken into the station at East 104th Street, none of them were formally charged because they were all younger than 15. But they did get a lecture. Uh, They were told they would be put in a cell if they were hauled in again. And once again, spanking was recommended to their parents when they came to collect the kids. We'll just keep unpacking all of the weirdness of this entire situation. It's weirdly ironic that we are recording this episode today because I think it is this week that one of, like, the National Pediatrics Associations was like, do not spank your children. It is bad. An incident on 115th Street sent 25-year-old Henry Gerber to the hospital. Gerber tried to fight back when a group of boys tried to take his hat, but he was overpowered. There were a lot more of them. He was beaten and kicked and left on the street. Yeah, so that advice about fighting back, maybe not so good. Uh, On 102nd Street, acting detective Sergeant Brindisi, remember that name, was jumped by a gang who threw his hat into the street. And he tried to give chase, but he tripped and he fell. He did manage to make one arrest. Uh, He arrested a man named Leo Cohen, who was not a boy. He was a grown man of age 34. And Cohen was booked on a disorderly conduct charge. Uh, Cohen was actually discharged by a judge after denying the charge that he had tripped Brindisi. Incidentally, the New York Tribune wrote up that same story, but with a few notable differences. The detective is listed as Rocco Brindisi, not Brindisi. The man he arrested is listed as Sigmund Cohn, who was a special policeman. He was not part of the riots, but Brindisi arrested him for tripping him as, quote, interfering with an officer in the discharge of his duty charge. The Tribune's coverage also indicated that the police were not especially concerned about all of this hat snatching. They, quote, were inclined to regard their activities lightly, the there being uh, the boys and young men who were doing this. And that is until plainclothes officers got jumped. And then things started to get a little more serious with the police. 16-year-old Morris Seikowitz, who was a resident of East 170th Street, was apprehended by the man he and his friends tried to attack. When the group approached Harry Oldbaum at 116th and Lexington, they managed to get his hat, but Oldbaum fought back and ended up chasing several of the young men until he caught Seikowitz, and Seikowitz got a disorderly conduct charge. But when Seikowitz went directly before Magistrate Peter A. Hatting at night court, He was about to be sentenced to jail time when a surprising thing happened. His victim, Oldbaum, moved by the presence of Sykowitz's elderly mother, intervened, and he actually asked the judge to be lenient. And Magistrate Hatting agreed to this, but he was adamant that he would jail the next hat hoodlum, adding, quote, I intend to see that citizens are protected in their property. Hatting was true to his word on this. The next case he saw was that of A. Silverman, who had been charged with smashing straw hats after Abraham Birnbaum had filed a complaint against him. Silverman was sentenced to three days in jail for hat snatching and destruction. So one of the incidents of the night of September 15th, as reported by the New York Times, is to me a little bit confusing in its wording. So their report reads, quote, John Sweeney, 10 of 363 West 16th Street ran into an automobile driven by John Monfort of 411 East 19th Street while John and the other boys were enjoying the hat-smashing sport on 7th Avenue between 17th and 18th Streets. His right leg was broken. He was taken to Bellevue Hospital for treatment. So it sounds like this kid collided with a car while he was on foot, but because both the child and the driver were named John and perhaps... Also, because the paper maybe didn't want there to be any indication that the car hit the child, but rather the child was responsible for running into the car. Uh, It reads a little weird. You don't often see a, a, a person on foot described as running into a car. It is worth noting that hat stores stayed open long past their normal closing times during all of this so that gentlemen could come in and purchase appropriate autumn headwear and this stave off being attacked for their straw hats 
These stores did a massive business during this time. Over the next several nights, the Straw Hat Riot slowly died down. While the following years had some level of this strange hat vigilante behavior, it was not on the level of the 1922 riot. Just a few years later, on September 20th, 1925, the New York Times ran a brief article with the headline, Discard Date for Straw Hats Ignored by President Coolidge. The blurb mentioned that the president had worn a straw hat with a black brim on both the 18th and the 19th of the month, and no one snatched it from his head or stomped it to pieces. And that is a very weird moment in New York history. (laughs) It is very weird. (laughs) It just strikes me as so completely strange and one of those things that I, I think sometimes when you read modern articles about it, it kind of gets sensationalized to be like this crazy brawl. Uh, like I said, that one account of of the the dock workers being involved suggested that there was a brawl and it actually stopped traffic on the Manhattan Bridge. I don't know if that were true or not. But yeah, it it's often depicted as though it was like this wild, maniacal thing. And it is interesting that some of the news reports are like, ah, oh, the police thought it was funny until some of their guys got jumped. <laughs> uh, so it clearly was not really considered like a, a terrifying riot or anything. More like this bizarre inconvenience. Of hat um, smashing. Of hat smashing. And man, don't smash my clothes or accessories. I will come for you. That's what yes. I say. <laughs> I can think of a very, very, very few circumstances when it might be appropriate to smash someone's hat. Like if someone had on a hat bearing a lot of racist slogans. Sure. Maybe it might be okay to smash that hat, but not if they're wearing a hat after September 15th. Well, especially because, I mean, like we mentioned uh, earlier on in the episode, these were great hat options for warm days because they were a little cooler, but they still let you get some shade and be, you know, presentable and wearing a hat, which was very, very important at the time for men. Uh, so I, why you got to be a jerk? Yeah. <laughs> and it can be really, really warm in New York, like well into the autumn. Yes. In October, sometimes it is hot in New York. So those kids are jerks. That's what I, that's my summation. <laughs> I have two pieces of listener mail. One, because it involves being a snappy dresser, uh, like wearing a hat, although it does not involve a hat specifically. And uh, and then a second one. We'll read the snappy dresser one first. It is from our listener, Sarah. She says, I'm listening to your episode on Bob Hope, and I thought I would share this picture of my grandfather who passed away this August. Here he is looking dapper with my sister in 1989. When I posted this on Instagram, my dad told me the story that when Pop Hop was in the Army during World War II, Cary Grant came to entertain the troops. This was part of the USO, which was also part of that Bob Hope episode. And he got a seat right up front, and he said he felt like a schlub in his uniform compared to the well-dressed Grant. And he decided that when he got out of the Army, he would start dressing like that too. And he did for the rest of his life. Not super relevant, but I hope you enjoy this picture of my beloved grandfather and my sister wearing one of his sweaters. Uh, He is indeed a snappy dresser. (laughs) Um, And that is a really beautiful, fun story and a gorgeous picture. So thank you so much for sharing that, Sarah. Um, Our other listener mail that I have today is a little bit of a gear change from that. It is about our Princess Sophia uh, tragedy episode. It is from our listener, Lisa, and it uh, is a piece of physical mail. And Lisa writes on an absolutely adorable otter card, I love your show. Thank you so much for the informative, entertaining podcast. I recently listened to your episode on the Princess Sophia. And then I happened to be in Juneau, Alaska on the 100th anniversary, and I went to an opera about the tragedy. I think you now have many more listeners from Alaska. Thank you for all your work. And she very sweetly sent us um, her program from the opera. So I will have that in the office the next time Tracy is here because I know she will love to see it. Uh, It's very cool. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. You can also find us pretty much everywhere on social media as Missed in History, and you can find uh, back episodes of every show and show notes for every episode Tracy and I have worked on on our website, mistinhistory.com. You can subscribe to Stuff You Missed in History class on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 